and pull up the lectures lecture. All right, we're going to talk about chemical reactions today. We're going to do some practice with um, with uh, Lewis dot structures and formal charge and Vesper geometries. Um, and then we're going to we're going to start talking about chemical reactions. Um, and then start doing some calculations with that because the last couple topics that we have to cover before the midterm wind up being about 30% of the midterm, wind up being these conversions we're going to learn how to do um, when it comes to chemical reactions. Uh, turns out that's one of the most important skills you get out of this class that you carry forward into other science classes is the is the ability to to predict how much product you're going to make based on how much reactants you start with. All right, so let's start with some practice for Lewis with Lewis dot structures and Vesper geometries. Okay, um, a, we spent time doing water and uh, the one on the bottom right is formaldehyde, so we'll leave those ones off. Um, but let's start with with phosphorus pentafluoride. Give that a go. I'll give you a few minutes to work on these. Your end goal for each of these is the molecular geometry of each of these. Okay, so go through the steps. Get the right Lewis thought structure, check your formal charges, count your electron groups, check what the geometry is. All right, so start by total up your valence electrons, right? Between phosphorus and fluoride, what's going to go in the middle? Um, phosphorus. And why? Uh, Too many fluorines. We would, we could pick one fluorine and put it in the in the middle, but what's the other? Um, less electronegative, which means it's better at sharing. So whatever's less electronegative or has the most vacancies are usually two ways of saying the same thing uh, is what's going to go in the middle. And then put those fluorines around it. Then what do we do? Start making bonds. We have a couple choices for the fluorines. We could put all five fluorines attached to the phosphorus, or we could have four fluorines attached to the phosphorus and put the other fluorine over here, or attach it to this one over here. We'll look at those in a minute. Are about deciding between those two options. How many electron? Either way, how many electrons have I used so far? Ten. How many? How many do I need to put around each fluorine? Any or total? How many does fluorine want? Eight. So it's another six around each fluorine, right? How many fluorines do we have? Five. So five times six, that's going to use up all of our electrons. Nice when everything works out cleanly like that, right? Okay. 
everything satisfied here? We use the right number of electrons. Everything has a full valence. What about formal charges? What's the formal charge on each fluorine? So each fluorine owns seven electrons. And how many electrons does it have on the periodic table? Seven. seven. So that's a formal charge of zero for all the fluorines here, right? How about the phosphorus? How many electrons does the phosphorus own right here? Five. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Five. Also, that gives us another formal charge of what? Zero. Zero. If we can go through this and everything has a formal charge of zero, is there any possible way we could improve this? Can't get closer to zero than zero, right? If we thought, if we guessed this first, we go around and assign count all these electrons. And I believe that means we Let's see. I think we have an extra pair of electrons we would have to put right there to get us a total of 40. What does that do to our formal charges? Four of our fluorines are still zero, right? But then this fluorine is going to have a charge of what? It owns six. And on the periodic table, it's got seven, right? Plus one. Plus one. We'll get it one of these days. What about the phosphorus? How many electrons does the phosphorus own? Six. Two that it owns outright and four bonds. And so that's a minus one. So even though this structure also meets our first two criteria, we use the right number of electrons and we wind up with everything with a full valence. This one's not as good because our formal charges are not as close to zero. Right? The net formal charge is still zero, but the phosphorus and, and this, this fluorine right here are not as stable as they could be. So with that in mind, What's our electron geometry going to be? Let's pick our best formal or our best Lewis dot structure, trigonal bipyramidal. Or if you're trying to draw it instead of memor memorizing names, remember it's going to look like that trigonal planar shape. So just three of them that are flat, 120 degrees from each other plus an extra fluorine straight up and an extra fluorine straight down. Right, so these three that are in the middle are all on the same plane, 120 degrees from each other. And then 90 degrees from that above and 90 degrees below that plane are the fourth and fifth fluorines. Or, get the hang of trigonal means three-sided and bipyramid means you got a three-sided pyramid facing up, pointing up, and a three-sided pyramid pointing down. You can picture putting two three-sided pyramids on top of each other. And for my for my uh, Dungeons and Dragons players or RPG players, two D4s sharing one side. Visually is what we're looking at here. So that's the electron geometry. Is there anything different about the molecular geometry? What's the difference between molecular geometry and electron geometry? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. 
our electron geometry is always going to be one of these, this first column here, right? Where we pretend we can see everything. The molecular geometry is only going to be different from the electron geometry if one of these things is a lone pair. If one of the things attached to the phosphorus is a lone pair, we can't see it. And if we can't see it, then that makes our molecular geometry look different. So for instance, if this was a lone pair, its electron geometry would still be trigonal bipyramid. But its molecular geometry, we'd have to pretend we couldn't see this. We, we can only see the effects of that. We can't see the lone pair itself. And that's when we come to this chart. And we look, okay, where well, I'm still in this row of five, there's still five electron domains, but I can only see four of them. That's going to give us a seesaw shape or a sawhorse shape. If you don't have any lone pairs around the central atom, then your molecular geometry and your electron geometry are the same. If you have a lone pair, they're not the same. We'll use water as an example, just because we've already done the Lewis dot structure for water enough times that I'm just going to throw it up on the board. And water's Lewis dot structure is going to look like this. So what's its electron geometry? How many things are taking up space around the oxygen? Two that we can see. Do the lone pairs still take up space? So it's four. It's got four things around it. So its electron geometry is tetrahedral. Its molecular geometry is where we then say, okay, Sure, it's tetrahedral, but we can only see two of those things. If I was going to redraw it and, and try to show that three-dimensional shape with those wedges and dashes. So remember that the dashes mean that the hydrogen is going into the board away from us. And the wedge, the triangle, means that the hydrogen is sticking out of the board towards us. So our electron geometry tells us that this is the shape of the molecule. If we want to know what the molecular geometry is, we still have all four of those things taking up space, but we can only see two of the four. So it doesn't, the electron geometry doesn't change. It's, I heard somebody say linear earlier because it seems like, oh, there's only two things taking up space. Remember, the lone pairs are still there. We just can't see them. All right, the analogy that I use is um, if somebody puts their, uh, if you're getting on a bus and somebody is already sitting in a seat and they have their backpack on the seat next to them, from the front of the bus, it might look like that's an empty seat, right? You can't, you can't tell why nobody else is sitting in that seat until you get close enough to see the backpack. Right? The backpack is taking up space, even though you can't see the backpack from the front of the bus. The lone pairs still take up space, even though we can't see them. So what's our molecular geometry for water then? It's not linear. So we still have four electron domains, four things taking up space. If we had one lone pair that we couldn't see, we'd call that trigonal pyramid. Two lone pairs means if we just call it bent or angle. Or be able to draw them. 
like I said, these first, the electron geometries, you're going to wind up memorizing because it's always, there's only five of them. And we're going to use one of them every single time we do this. The, the rest of these are a little bit, you know, you're not always going to use them. So as long as you can draw them with the wedges and the dashes properly, okay, with about the right angles, I don't care if you remember the name as long as you can draw it. That would change it. So in that case, that would change the whole geometry. So we'd have phosphorus, fluorine, fluorine. So we had this. What is our structure here? This isn't our best Lewis thought structure, but we can still look at this and assign the, um, the geometries to it. We, now we kind of have two central atoms, right? This fluorine has how many, um, how many electron groups taking up space? Four, two that we can see, so it's just like water. So this fluorine is bent. This phosphorus still has five things taking up space, but we can only see four of them. So its electron geometry would be would be trigonal bipyramid, but its molecular geometry would be a sawhorse. A seesaw. Alyssa? Yes. At least how to draw them. But again, so to set your mind at ease, this is Lewis thought structures and these geometries collectively is only 10% of the midterm. All right, so let me pull up the midterm, the practice midterm real quick so you can see what I'm what I mean so that you're not panicked about this. So it's going to have a definitions section. It's going to have some a sig fig section. So you're going to 10% of your each of these is going to be a total of 10 problems. Each problem is 10 points, so a total of 100. Every problem is worth 10% of the overall grade on the on the test. So that means that 10% of your grade is just can you plug in some basic arithmetic and do the rounding properly? Right, you should at least, everybody should get at least like eight out of 10 on this one. We've spent enough time on sig figs, right? And everybody knows how to plug. So, and the way that I grade these, each of these is two and a half points. One point is just, did you plug it into your calculator properly? One point is, did you round properly? And half a point is, did you do the units properly? Right, so I give lots of partial credit on these. Uh, it's, the test is set up to help you succeed and let me give you lots of points along the way. And that also applies to, this also might help set your mind at ease. 10% of, of your final grade is, can you count protons, neutrons, and electrons and do an electron configuration? This should be a piece of cake for most of us, right? Even if you stumble a little bit over 3D versus 4D or whatever, your, your issues with the electron configuration, everybody in here can count protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? And I would love for this to be the first class ever where I get to give solid tens on this problem for the entire class. There's usually one person who miscounts or reverses the charges on the electrons, Brody. Right, but you it's it's an easy mistake to make in a testing situation, right? But there's a lot of easy points in this test too. So the fact that 10% of it is this, draw Lewis dot structure, give me the molecular geometry, and I'm gonna change this. It's gonna be electron geometry and molecular geometry. Well, we won't talk about polarity and hybridization until after the midterm. Um, so that'll look a little bit different, but it's 
basically give me your best Lewis dot structure. And that's going to be three out of the five points here is give me the Lewis dot structure. And then the other two is, did you get me the right, at least a drawing with approximately the right angles for the molecular geometry? Right. So overall, if you count all of that, that's four points on the entire test is going to be Lewis dot structure, or it's going to be these geometries. So don't panic. Don't overstudy for this at the expense of some of the easier points, right? Make sure you get the easy points. And we'll continue to practice this and get better at it. All right. Where is where'd my slideshow go? There it goes. All right, let's do one more practice here. We're gonna do xenon tetrafluoride or sulfur tetrafluoride. Sulfur. Let's do sulfur. Start with your Lewis dot structure. Count your electrons. So sulfur has got six electrons, and then we have four fluor fluorines that each have seven valence electrons, so 28, total of 34, I believe. Valence electrons. Out of sulfur and fluorine, what's what's least electronegative? So what goes in the middle? Sulfur. Put your fluorines around it. Start by making your bonds. There's eight electrons, right? So we got 26 electrons left. How many electrons are we gonna spend filling up the fluorines? Total of 24, each fluorine still needs six. And there's four of them, six times four is 24. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. We didn't use up all of our electrons this time. We have two electrons left. That's what we do when we don't have enough electrons, not when we have too many. When we have too many, we've got to stick them somewhere. On a sulfur. Why sulfur and not pick a fluorine? And thirds. Yes, the fluorines are already full. So is the sulfur, but sulfur, sulfur is on the third row of the periodic table, which means we've got that empty d orbital to play with. We can go past eight electrons for sulfur. We can't go past eight electrons on the fluorines. And if we check our formal charges, a fluorine with full valence and one bond is formal charge of zero. We already did those ones, right? Sulfur here owns six electrons, four from the bonds plus a lone pair that it owns outright. And how many electrons does sulfur have on the periodic table? Six. Everything's got a formal charge of zero. It's what makes it a, a stable compound. So what's the geometry then? How many things are taking up space around the sulfur? Oh, five. Five. Trigonal, Trigonal bipyramid. bipyramid for the electron geometry. And then if it's, and if you're going to draw that, you 
three things in the middle, all about 120 degrees from each other, a fluorine straight up and a fluorine straight down. There's our electron geometry. And if we want to know the molecular geometry, leave everything where it is and just erase the electrons. It's not like it rearranges itself, the tetrahedral, because those electrons are still there. We just can't see them. So it's a sawhorse, seesaw. All right, how are we feeling about these? The names are tricky, especially the molecular geometry names. The electron geometry names aren't so bad when you get the hang of them. There's only five of them. Alyssa? I would recommend it because it'll save you time. But at the same time, as long as you can draw them properly, and when I say properly, I mean, in a way that looks like this, with about the right bond angles and using the wedges and the dashes, if you need to. Anything that's trigonal planar or linear, that's really easy, right? Anything tetrahedral, if you're trying to draw it instead of name it, you're going to want to use those wedges and dashes. And then... I always forget that this that this screen chops off a little bit here, so you can't see the very bottom names here. Um, but again, if you know those words, pyramid, pyramid, planar, um, trigonal, those are all helpful words to help describe those shapes. Once you get the hang of using those, those it's it's not too bad, but it's a lot of vocabulary to throw at you at once, especially since we're not used to using, doing geometry in three dimensions really, right? All right. Any other questions on these geometries? All right, we're gonna talk about reactions then. Get something, or do you wanna come up with some questions now that I say it, put it that way? So reactions, chemical reactions is where we've been headed this whole time. The whole point of not starting with these is one, you've got to get a good basis in conversions first, because we're going to start doing a bunch of conversions with chemicals soon. Mm -hmm. The other reason that we wait on doing this is because if we need to be able to describe all the pieces here before we start being able to actually do much in the way of calculations. All right, so... So the way that this class is set up, we call we take what's called an atoms first approach, where we look at the atomic structure and all that before we get into the reactions themselves, so that the reactions don't just seem like memorizing things. Um, this is the way that you're you probably have seen chemical reactions written before, whether you knew they were chemical reactions or not. But each of these the components here have their own um, descriptor. Basically, if it's something that you started with, we call it a reactant. If it's something that you're making or producing, we call it a product. Easy enough, right? Reactant is a little bit of a different word. Um, sometimes you also hear reactants. The old way of naming them was, would be reagents. Reagent means exactly the same thing as reactant. There's a few times where my old training takes over and I might slip and say, say reagent instead of reactant, they mean literally the exact same thing though. One's just more old fashioned. And then the other key aspect here is the reaction arrow. And the reaction arrow, chemists get very, very particular about their reaction arrows because it's actually one of the places, one of many places where we try to convey a lot of information very, very succinctly. Um, so we tend to be kind of picky about that. As long as you just draw a regular arrow, then you're fine. Um, when we start getting involved in equilibrium and resonance and and uh, showing how electrons move, the arrows wind up being more important or and something you need to pay attention to more. For now, it's just a regular arrow, call it a reaction arrow. 
What else do you see in this that that you're not quite sure what it is or what it means? G. Anybody have a guess? Gases. Not grams is a good guess, but it's actually it's the phase of the reactants. So basically, this is this is the reaction of butane in the presence of oxygen burning and forming CO two and water. So it's just burning butane. Um, butane burns as a gas, not as a liquid. It's in a if you've seen a lighter, a, a, a cigarette lighter that has liquid butane in it, it doesn't actually burn as the liquid very well. It burns as a gas. Uh, and so there are certain reactions where the phase winds up mattering a lot, especially as how you're going to measure something. If I was going to tell you to measure how much CO2 was produced, the fact that it's a gas is going to change how you measure it, right? Because how do you measure how much gas we have? You can't just use the scale to figure to weigh how, how many grams, right? So the phase will affect how we measure things and how we get to calculate how many moles we have. Uh, so as you would expect, three primary uh, phases here, solid, liquid, gas. The other one that you see a lot, it's not technically its own phase, but it happens enough we have a shorthand for it, is aqueous. Anybody want to guess what aqueous means? Gas and water. Close. Yeah, actually, oxygen can be aqueous. Gases can be aqueous. It means that you've got something dissolved in water. It doesn't have to be a gas. It just means that if you have, say, if you make salt water, sodium chloride dissolved in water, it's not a solid and it's not a liquid, it's aqueous. And so we just say, right, AQ. So this would be the chemical symbol for salt water versus salt in its solid form. We'd write like that. And you actually can get salt as a liquid but it's really, really, really hot. And it's really, really, really high energy. Uh, interestingly enough, if you melt salt, it actually turns to this really opaque purple color uh, because it starts absorbing in different wavelengths of light once you start, once you break the ionic bonds that are holding the, the sodiums and the chlorides and the solid phase, it actually gets a totally different color to it. Um, one of the few substances that do that. Most things, the color doesn't really change when they change phase, but ionic compounds, that happens sometimes. And then in theory, if you got really, really, really hot, you could have sodium chloride as a gas. That'd be, I mean, we're talking probably close to 10,000 Celsius. So getting just to here requires a blast furnace. Um, and just because it's Friday, let's look at a video. This is a guy called the Backyard Scientist. Um, I'm, what? This is educational. Man. All right. So. Well, you know what to Google now. Backyard scientists melted sodium chloride. No, it's, it pulls it up and then I think maybe it's blocked. I'll try, I'll try Chrome. Backyard scientist. Yeah, I think it must be it must be the network. 
Ah, it's an idea. I don't have Tom's sign-in info, but I have mine. Give this a try. If not, I'll post a link on the Canvas shell, and you cool. can watch it at your leisure. Nope, still is uh, still restricted. All right. Well, I'll look at that and see about fixing that later. That was not what I meant to do either. Well, we got to open up the slides again. Does this? That's the one I want. No. Nope. All right, hang on. Let me get logged into Dropbox. There we go. That's way back. Hang on. I can't navigate when I can't see the mouse. <laughs> wow, this is a fun little break. Here we go. All right. So how do these chemical reactions work? So solid, liquid, gas, aqueous. Um, we can have solutions of things that aren't aqueous. If that's the case, we just have to specify. Almost the most common solution that we have on here on Earth, uh, especially as water-based organisms, uh, is, is uh, solids dissolved in water. If we lived on a different planet, um, we would have different. Um, if we lived on a planet where the the most common liquid was met was uh, methane, we would probably have a shorthand for dissolved in methane. Um, as it is, this is the one we have the shorthand for. If you need to say any other specifics about it, you just give the information underneath. Um, and so, if I was trying to say, um, I don't know. Acetic uh, acid. This is going to work. If we want to say dissolved in in uh, benzene, we would just write dissolved in benzene underneath it. Right. So for the most part, this is our most common situation. And it's really the only one you're going to see here. These are the four phases you're going to deal with. There are other phases, obviously, or other types of solutions, um, but these are the most common. So the other thing that's tricky about these is that we still have to abide by conservation of mass. If we have to abide by conservation of mass, there's a problem with this reaction the way it's written. What is it? What's off about this equation if we're thinking about conservation of mass? Yeah, we started with oh, 10 hydrogens and we ended with only two. We started with four carbons and we ended with only one. That can't be true, right? When we get into talking about nuclear reactions, some things may change. But in general, until we get to nuclear reactions, whatever you start with, you have to end with. So if we're going to burn butane, that is C4H10, are we actually only going to make one CO2? How many CO2s would we expect to make? Difficult to say, but was we know we have to have the same number of carbons before and after. So if we have to have the same number of carbons, we've got to make be making four CO2s. This process is called balancing the reaction. 
we balance the reaction by making sure we start and end with the same number of atoms and the same identities of the atoms. We start with four carbons, we've got to end with four carbons. We start with 10 hydrogens, we've got to end with 10 hydrogens. So what is that going to look like when we try to balance this? C4H10, I'm going to leave off the phases for the sake of balancing. You know how to do this? Okay. So what are we going to do? Oh, like certain things like things that are balancing the same balance. Exactly. And it's a little bit of glorified guess and check. You can solve it mathematically if you use linear algebra and matrices in systems of equations, but that's more trouble than it's worth most, most of the time. But basically, pick an atom and balance it. So we could start with the carbons. We've got four carbons over here. We've got to make four carbons on the right-hand side, on the product side. If we've got 10 hydrogens over here, the only thing that's making hydrogen, that's using hydrogen over here is the water, right? Every water has two hydrogens. So how many water molecules do we need to make? Five. So when you burn one butane molecule, you make four CO2 molecules and five water molecules. Is everything balanced now? What's unbalanced? Uh, so it's a whole bunch of oxygens, right? Left side. So we got to do this side. We have a total of four times two is eight plus another five is 13 oxygens. Can we get to 13 oxygens over here? We can get close, but we can't. Close isn't good enough here. We need the same number of oxygens. We're going to do more than that. There's, there is no, if we have an odd number of oxygens over here, the only way we can add oxygens on this side is it has an even number, right? No matter what we do. So if you have an odd number and you want to make it even, you double it. So we just, everything that's already balanced, we're just going to double it. We put a two there. Now we have eight carbons. So the four becomes an eight. The five becomes a 10. And now we've got an even number on the right-hand side, right? We have 26 oxygens now. Then we need 13 O2 molecules. Right, that process of balancing the reactions, it's always going to go something like, sometimes it's going to be really easy, put a, a one here and a two there. Um, sometimes it takes a couple tries. Basically, if you start by balancing the atoms that are in your biggest molecule, then at most you're going to have a situation like this where you got everything balanced except oxygen, then we had to go back and double everything. That's about the most complicated case. That you'll see on a regular basis anyway. All right, so this is just going through those, counting those oxygens and hydrogens and carbons. And would you look at that. That's exactly what, what we came up with. So we must have done it right. Good job. Those numbers, the numbers of, of molecules in front of each of these, we call coefficients. They're different than the subscripts that are built into the formula because we change one of the subscripts, we change what that molecule is. We can't just go and do something like that because now it's not oxygen anymore. Now it's ozone. And ozone reacting with butane is a different reaction. It's going to balance out differently. So we're never going to change the subscripts once we have them written. The only thing we can change is the coefficients because that's not changing what we have, just how many we have. So let's practice some more.
Most of these are not as tricky as that last one. And the last ones, two of them are already balanced for some reason. All of them are already balanced. What's going on here? What have I done? All right, well, let's do, let's, I'll make up some off the top of my head. Let's say uh, sodium chloride and lead for nitrate. How would we balance this up? There's a couple places you can start. So you can distribute, we don't really want to distribute this because we can look at this and say that's four nitrates when we distribute it, then it's hard to tell what it is because there's a lot of different possible Lewis dot structures you could have. All right. As far as balancing this, where's the, where's a good place to start? What are we going to do with it? We've got four chlorides over here and only one chloride over here. So we know we need at least a four to one ratio here between the sodium chloride and the lead poor chloride. And, uh, Then we need four there to balance out our sodiums. And that takes care of our nitrates for us by doing that, right? Yeah. So everything else is good. If you don't see a coefficient written, you can assume it's a one. Um, if on the test, I frequently will write it like that. I still want you to write a one if I leave in a blank space. I'm not going to mark you down for it, but I'm, if I leave space specifically for it, I would want to see you write it out. But that's just personal preference. If you don't see a number, it can't be a zero. So assume it's a one. Let me, what's a, what's a tricky one? Hang on. Mm, that's not as complicated as I thought it was. That's still not a bad one to look at though. Um, all right. So this is the reaction in, uh, in airbags. This is a compound with N3 with a negative one charge on your list of polyatomics. It's on in the gen chems list, so I wasn't sure. So this is a, a polyatomic ion called azide that has a negative one charge to it. Sodium azide, when you put an electrical current into it, forms sodium metal and nitrogen gas. And it does it really, really quickly. And then the sodium metal actually goes on to continue to react and produce more moles of gas. Um, so the fact that this happens so quickly is what allows airbags to deploy so fast. It's basically, it's, has anybody ever seen those those videos of people like pranking pranking their friends by putting putting a um, an airbag underneath the seat in a garage or something like that? It's a common prank among people that work in, in uh, automotive garages. Pretty dangerous because it will launch you a lot further than you would expect. Um, so don't do that. Um, and the way that this is triggered in a car is actually pretty interesting. It's basically the steering column of a car has a basically just a metal ball bearing in it that's kind of just resting in the bottom of a 
of a hole. If you decelerate fast enough, that ball bearing comes out of the hole. And when it does that, it completes a circuit that causes this reaction to happen. So basically, at least that's the old school way of doing it. Now they probably use more, more electronic sensors and computer-based stuff. But the old school way of doing it was literally just a metal ball. And when the metal ball fell out of the hole, it triggered this and, and set off an, an airbag reaction. So how do we balance this? Two, two, three. I took my time. So you had enough time to figure that out. How did you get there? Very good. The other way to think about it is, again, we've got an odd number on this side and an even number of nitrogens on that side. So we know that we've got to have whatever the coefficient is, it's got to be an even coefficient on this side to make this an even number of nitrogens. And if you do that, we made six nitrogens here. Now we need six nitrogens here. Nitrogens are balanced, and now we can just finish up with the sodiums. All right, so balancing is not, it can take a little bit of practice, but you should always know when you get it right because all you really have to do to, to check your work on these is add up how many of every atom before and after. As long as you get the same number of, of nitrogens before and after, the same number of sodiums before and after, you got it right. The only place that you could mix yourself up is sometimes if you wind up with it, if you put a four there, then we would have a six here and a four there. That's not, that's still balanced. It's not the best way to balance it. We want the lowest whole number ratio um for these and so if you ever wind up with all of your coefficients being even you just divide everything by two you just missed something somewhere in the balancing process and wound up with four four six but we can take that and reduce it to two two and three and that's the better answer so on the test there's several problems that are that are based around this that are 10 point problems Four of the points in most of them in those are going to be just balanced reaction. And if you got this answer, that's three, three and a half out of four. It's still technically balanced. It'll give you the right numbers, but it's not as correct as it could be if you reduce it. All right, so let's do some more practice. And then we'll add another wrinkle. We have time today. If not, we'll tackle it on Monday. Another react reaction is called a combustion reaction. Anytime you have something that's all carbons and hydrogens or carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and it reacts with O2 and makes CO2 and water, that's a combustion reaction. So basically when you burn stuff. C2H2 is a really common molecule called acetylene. Does anybody know what acetylene is used for? No? It's not the first time I've brought up welding, is it? I think I asked if anybody's taken any welding classes already. Uh, that's most common place you see acetylene used to this day is still in acetylene torches for, for welding, for cutting balls. Turns out when you get the right ratio of acetylene to oxygen, it burns really, really hot in a really, really directed way. So let's start by balancing this. How many CO2s are we going to make? Two. How many waters are we going to make? Two hydrogens here. So we would say we can make one water. What did we run into? 
the oxygen is odd again, right? So just double everything. Two, four, two. Now our carbons and hydrogens are still balanced, right? And now we've got an even number of oxygens. So we can do this. We wind up with a total of 10 oxygens on the right-hand side. So we need 10 oxygens on the left-hand side. With these combustion reactions, and anytime you can add a single atom without changing anything else, that's usually what you want to leave till the end, because we can make oxygen whatever we need to without throwing off the work we already did. This is out of order a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about an acetylene tank. We went to Prax Air down on Third Street over by uh, Miss Marsh's dance studio. Um, you can get a five kilogram tank of acetylene. How many moles of acetylene are in a five kilogram tank of acetylene? What's acetylene? C2H2. Oh, okay. It's this one. You know how many kilograms you have. We have five kilograms. of acetylene. Acetylene is not the best name for it. We think OCHEM will learn the systematic way of naming it. Acetylene is a common name. The systematic name would be ethyne, but nobody calls it ethyne because acetylene is so, so commonly used. How many moles of acetylene is that? How are we going to figure that out? Use the molar mass. Molar mass is in what units? Grams per mole. So we're in kilograms here, so we have to do a quick one-step conversion to get from kilograms to grams. What does that conversion look like? What am I going to write on the bottom? One kilogram. And then what goes on top? And how many? A thousand. So 5.00 times 10 to the 3 grams of acetylene. 5,000. Yeah. It's easy to do. <laughs> Call that slipping a decimal place. It happens all the time when I'm doing mental, mental arithmetic. All right. So now how are we going to get to moles? Grams per mole. That's the C2H2, just to add up the pieces, right? Two carbons plus two hydrogens. So two times 12.011 for the carbons plus two times 1.008 for the hydrogens. We get what? 20, 26.04-ish. So for, for if we only care about three sig figs, that's close enough. 26.04 grams is one mole. That should all look familiar, right? Yes, sir. A little rusty. We haven't been doing much conversion math lately. Don't worry, it's all going to come back. So that's a way we have of using a mass to figure out how many moles of acetylene we have. But now that we have a balanced reaction, we have a way of predicting how much CO2 we're going to make. Because we've got a before and after, right? And if it's balanced, we know every time we burn two acetylene molecules, we make four CO2 molecules. Which also means if we burn two moles of acetylene, we make four moles of CO2. So this step, it's real, if you balance your reaction right, it's a really easy mathematical step to write out. We just literally say, okay, for every two moles of C2H2 is four moles CO2 produced.
this step where you take moles of one compound and convert it to moles of another compound has a, has a somewhat intimidating name. It's called stoichiometry. But you didn't even see that until I wrote it up on the board, right? So it's not that scary because so we got here without any trouble, right? It's only as soon as I call it stoichiometry that it seems intimidating. And all the logic behind stoichiometry is actually really simple. Conservation of mass means we've got to balance things. If it's balanced and we've got a before and after, we can convert from one to the other. We can actually convert from one reactant to another reactant. As long as it's balanced, we can take any ratio we want out of these numbers and write ourselves a conversion with it. So if we want to know how many grams of CO2 are produced from five kilograms of acetylene, we've got, we've got all the work up here to get us the moles of CO2. So 5,000 grams for every 26 grams, that's one mole. So 5,000 under over uh, 26, it's going to be like 40, I think. That's four for every 100 grams, and we've got no, be 200 moles ish. Who's got a calculator out? Who are we getting next? Yeah. You're okay. You're, hey, don't be sorry. You're the only one who pulled the calculator out and started actually working on this. What did you get? Uh, <laughs> so, 5,000 divided by 25 has got to be really close so, to 1,536. 1,536? 1, I really messed that up, didn't I? I might have messed that up. Yeah, it shouldn't be that big. I'm guessing you slipped a decimal too. It's probably 153.6. I've got the wealth of human knowledge at my fingertips. I don't know why. I had 192.0. Oh, except then I forgot to multiply by two. So that was moles of acetylene. And then for every two moles of acetylene, that's four moles of CO2. So 384 moles of CO2 produced. It's a lot. We don't usually measure things in moles directly, right? Because a mole is hard to measure. So how we would usually measure this in terms of a mass. How do we figure out how many grams of CO2 are produced? We already did one just like that, except with acetylene, right? We're just going to do a molecular mass calculation, but backwards from how we did it before. For every one mole CO2 is, I believe it's 44.01. 009, I think if I'm carrying more decimals. There's your 384 times 44. I believe we get something around 16 kilograms, 16,000. That one I didn't do the arithmetic. I remember that this problem was about 16 kilograms. Is it the same mental mass? Sometimes I get close and sometimes I don't. <laughs> but there's no faster way to get everybody else to pull out calculators than to write the wrong number on the board because everybody wants to tell me I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. 
So about 17 kilograms. That's that's a little surprising considering we only started with five kilograms. <laughs> we bought we only bought a five kilogram tank, but we made 16, 17 kilograms of CO2. Yeah, where'd that where'd that extra mass come from? From the oxygen. So if you're actually doing welding, you actually need an oxygen tank and an acetylene tank so you can control the ratio so that you can get it in this two to five ratio. Gets you the best, the hottest flame and most complete combustion. Um, but if we just took this acetylene and we just set it on fire in the atmosphere, it's just gonna pull oxygen atoms, oxygen molecules from the atmosphere and that's gonna make up the rest of this mass. All right, so the, the total mass doesn't change between these two. The total mass acetylene plus oxygen is going to be equal to the total mass of CO2 plus water. But when you're only looking at two pieces at a time, sometimes it's easy to miss that. All right. We will start with How's the nomenclature packet gone? Everybody gone. finished yesterday? Gone. Everybody's going to get it turned in, right? All right. So with this being midterms, week this week, midterm grades has got to go in, get everything turned in um, this weekend. That's your quiz this weekend. Get everything turned in that you can, especially stuff that I've already graded so it's sitting there with a zero, but I could give you a five out of 10 on it that's going to make your midterm grade look a lot better really easily, right? Get all that outstanding stuff turned in this weekend. Yeah. And then have a good weekend. Um, I mean, it's not a Tuesday, I think. But if you have it, you can do it. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to shut off the uh, I did. Did you play? Yeah. So